Good afternoon, and I'm really sorry for the technical issues. Um, it's the 3rd of November, almost 2.30, and so we're ready for this 2D session uh, on changing travel behavior. I will wait one minute more, and then we'll kick off. I hope you had a great lunch and that you're full of energy for this se session, but because here we go. So, good afternoon, your invisible audience here at session 2D of the Polis conferences. Um, I'd like to welcome you, and I think this is foremost the most interesting set challenge of today, because it's about the most interesting challenge of sustainable mobility, namely changing people's behavior. Well, that's my opinion, and that's uh, also the reason why I'm that honored to be here as your chair in this session. If you heard the keynote speaker this morning, you know movement matters. Uh, we have to get people moved, literally, to more sustainable um, modes of transport, walking, cycling, uh, public centers, etc. I believe to get moved or to be moved, you have to meet for life, to feel energy, to see emotions. We can't unfortunately. So let's try to do it as best as possible on this digital way. Um, this morning, in the opening session, um, the panel um, was very clear on the requirements of the need for change, behavioral change. They talked about a mobility system that is affordable, accessible and simple. They talked about tax benefits for the one cycling. They talked about policymakers that really live in their city as their citizens do. But let's see and hear how the speakers of this session think about this and how you're dealing with this as well. I'm happy to present a little menu of this afternoon's session. I will scrape my screen and then let's go through it. So, welcome aboard. This is what we will do this afternoon. I will quickly go through some housekeeping rules with you. Then we'll meet and then we'll talk, of course. This is how uh, to make this session as interactive as possible with the housekeeping rules you may be already familiar with. If you have some questions, please go to this chat on the right and then to session and then you're really in the right chat of the session. Uh, we'll open a poll right away. And if you really want to answer it, uh, go to polls, to session, and there it is. If you really are eager to know who's attending this session, go to people and then this session, and you will see all the contact um, information there. If you want to maximize the screen, you can hide the chat or double click on the presentation or speaker. And of course, after this session, do try the networking function and visit the exhibition area um, that are also available on this platform. I hope this is clear, because then we can meet. Um, I'm Els, I'm your moderator for this afternoon. I'm the General Director of Mobile 21, which is an uh, NGO based in Brussels, in Belgium. And we are 21 people really um, enthusiastic to empower people, citizens, organizations, and policymakers with the aim to realize the crucial mental shift we need. Because without uh, a mental shift, there will be no sustainable model shift. So we are happy to share uh, with researchers, with participatory processes, and with campaigns this uh, inspiration for mental um, shifts. We're active in EU projects and also in local project in Flanders. And I honestly, I have to say that we have a special crush for projects dealing with inclusive mobility. My objective for today is clear. I hope that you get inspired and that you also take the opportunity to inspire the others. And I'm convinced that the four speakers of today wish to do the same. They will present themselves just at the beginning of their own talk. Behind the scenes, there is Pasquale from Polis to moderate the chat session. So all your questions um, can be dropped there and then he will take care of it. And of course, I'm also eager to know who you are. So there is a little poll popping up. 
right away there at, at your right. Um, and please let us know which organization you represent uh, so that we know um, who we are talking to. The speakers are ready for you. Um, these are the four uh, experts in their field of nudging that are ready. Uh, there is Wilco from Groningen Bereikbaar, Katharina from Nudge TV, Michiel from the city of Antwerp, and Marijn from the Werkvermootschap. So we're almost gender equal. We uh, represented this afternoon and happy uh, to share with you a lot of insights and experiences. I hope the speakers are ready because then we'll talk. Um, every speaker gets a minute of 10 from me to talk. Um, we have afterwards time for some quick questions. So be ready with your questions in the chat. And after all four speakers have given their presentation, we have much more time for other uh, more in-depth questions. And this is, they all go, all your questions and reflections are, um, are welcome in the chat and will be moderated there. So if you're happy, I'm happy too. And then we can start. Um, I'm eager to know how the poll is going so that we know who you are. And I will kick off. Welcome. If you are ready, then the digital floor is yours. Wilco, yeah, are you there? I, I okay. Think I'm there. Yes, you are. Please. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you for uh, inviting me on this uh, policy event in 2020. Uh, I remember last year you, you all were in uh, in Groningen. It was very hot, beautiful weather, and now in uh, Tolbert, where I live in the north part of Groningen. Uh, it's very cold and there was ice on the water this uh, this morning and perhaps it, it gives uh, 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 an image of how we're feeling right now as, uh, as, it, as we're talking about mobility. Next slide, please. My name is uh, Wilco uh, Hayek. I'm the Managing Director from uh, Groningen Bereikbaar, but I think connecting Groningen is a better word. It also means uh, literally uh, about traffic and mobility, but it's all, uh, also connecting uh, people. Next slide, please. Uh, Groningen uh, Bereikbaar was uh, uh, standstill uh, 2012, according to uh, very big infrastructural works which are going on right now in Groningen on road and uh, rail. And that was a time that the 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 companies of the city of Groningen said to the government, we have to work together to uh, uh, stay ahead of the, uh, that we don't have traffic jams, uh, no, no pollution, etc. We have to work together by uh, planning the construction works, by providing each other the information and by uh, trying to uh, influence behavioral uh, 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 mobility in uh, in the city. Uh, Groningen is next slide, please. A city with a lot of students. Groningen is a mid-sized city, uh, uh, a quarter of a million uh, inhabitants uh, in the north part of uh, Holland, uh, with a, a, a low dense area around it. Uh, incoming commute traffic about fifty percent uh, in the morning and in the evening, of course and uh, a very lot of students one of five inhabitants is a student so groningen is also uh, uh, the youngest city of uh, of the netherlands and i heard today we are also the healthiest city of uh, the netherlands which was told today in the in the newspapers and oh, this, this is a slide yes what we are doing with the students since 2012 we have done uh, several things first we invited all the chairmen of the, uh, the executive boards of the educational uh, institutions 
we told them uh, which major infrastructure works will which are, which are planned and asked them to help us during those years secondly we asked the schools uh, and we invited them to uh, to to, to uh, differ the, the class schedules so the minutes to reduce the number of students during the rush hours by uh, making a program on, on uh, a program on adjusting the schedules of the schools uh, and we give some rewards and payments for this so that was the second first inviting the chairman second asking the schools to different the class schedules third we invited the students itself to come with ids by keeping the buses and roads uh, less crowded in the rush hours and we uh, we put all those, uh, no, not all those, but the best ideas, we put them in practice. And then you have to think about uh, exchanging the student public transport pass for e-bikes, for uh, for example, or change the, the weekly cheaper weekend pass. So the, uh, the, the buses and the trains in the rush hours became uh, diminished. It was third, the students. And fourth, we uh, asked the more the professionals, the, the teachers and the, the schedulers and the, also the secretaries to work together with us to uh, reduce car traffic. And all those uh, things be become uh, one in the declaration of intent, which we made in uh, 2017. Uh, hard working, trial by error, and we're doing well all, uh, at this point, also at a Dutch uh, level. Level. And then uh, uh, there was at one time there was COVID uh, in the beginning of this year. Uh, there was uh, uh, about 50% less car traffic, and about 78% uh, uh, less public transport travel. No more jams. No more accidents during the day no more car pollution etc and so we thought covid is a game changer for mobility so that's what uh, brought us to make the groningen schedule and as what you see here is the the groningen schedule we made appointed um, with, with all the educational institutions to uh, uh, adjust their schedules and as you can see on the slide, not only with the educational institutions, but also with the care uh, sector and, uh, and some, uh, some others. Uh, so this agreement uh, in the, the, uh, during the, the summer is the situation uh, right now. Uh, next slide, please. And it's a, a very successful model, I think. Why? And I show you here the, the zipper because at all levels of organizations working together uh, with us. There's not only the CEOs of the institutions, but also on the other hand, the students itself. And that's why, last slide please, I think I'm in time. Last slide please. That's what we are doing uh, right now. We, uh, yes, that's the last one. That are the, our post-corona ambitions, which we're working on right now, with uh, with our eye on uh, August uh, uh, next year, which we are going to try to uh, 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 goal uh, less mobility as a result of Corona, in uh, the, to develop it to a long-term goal uh, on climate-friendly. Tra travel uh, habits so uh, it's not only because covid it, it's not only because uh, of the, uh, uh, the, the the mobility in the city of Groningen uh, right now as a result of the infrastructural works but we're now changing it to a long-term climate friendly goal uh, just making a temporary a temporary step more structural and I think I'm on time right now so this is my first contribution and last slide i can imagine you have all kinds of questions about it this is our address and uh, we'll invite you to, to come to our website 
And of course, we invite you to come to the city of Groningen. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Wilco, um, for the interesting uh, presentation, as well as respecting the time schedule. And uh, you were right, there are already questions popping up. Um, of course, COVID as a change maker is high on our thinking list. Um, so I'll ask um, Pasquale to pick up the right questions here. Can you do that for us, Pasquale? Yes, yes, I will. Um... So I'm taking the first one from uh, uh, from the chat. It says, in your presentation, Wilco, you mentioned that schools got rewarded if they adjust their schedule. So less students are in rush hour. Can you give some example of these rewards? I, uh, yes, uh, I, it's, uh, I believe we give the, 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 the faculty or the location of the school which uh, works with us together, this adjust the schedule. Uh, they get they get an amount, I believe it was 2,000 euros for that location, for that team. So it, it's not a, a, a big uh, uh, amount of money, but for those people, uh, they can do with it what they want. They just have to cooperate with us uh, uh, in adjusting the time schedules. And that's a program we have in, uh, in Groningen, still have. Okay, then there is another question asking, what do you mean uh, with one-third blended learning? Well, that's the a, that's a long-term goal. At, at this moment, uh, 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 also in buses, as in schools, maximum one-third is allowed because okay. of COVID, because of health. And uh, that's the situation right now. And we think that's our goal. At uh, over one year, when uh, when we have a solution for COVID, then we have uh, you could say one third or twenty percent, one fifth uh, uh, at home, and uh, two thirds, eighty percent at school. So that's the goal mm -hmm. right now, and it are not my words, but it are the words of the CEOs of the educational institutions okay. to go for that goal. So one, perhaps one day in a week, you have to learn uh, at home. Four days a week, you have to learn at, uh, at school. And also uh, uh, not start uh, all the schools at 8.30, uh, but also spread the starting of the schools. Okay. Perfect. Uh, there are two more. I'm not sure I completely understand the next one uh school schedules has also an effect on the other end of the journey does it fit on that side yep are the, the transports the, available yeah, yeah. yeah question of marshall from then elson uh, a few yeah. seconds ago i, I, I read oh yeah okay uh, yeah yeah, yeah uh, um, uh, what would they also because it's only one third it's it's at this moment it's not so busy in the uh, in, in the buses and the trains uh, in general at some uh, uh, specific roads at some specific locations it was in august september very very dense and so we made on specific uh, appointments with that location or we uh, more buses were driving uh, to that location so on, on both sides in the in the morning rush hour uh, the educational sector, uh, they don't all stop at two o'clock in, uh, in the afternoon. So the, the, the spreading in the, in the afternoon is bigger than in the, uh, in the morning hours. Okay, then there is a, uh, one last question from um, uh, an a participant asking, saying that it's a great approach this, uh, uh, of changing the schedule for uh, your zipper approach, Wilco. And do you think this can last longer, so can help uh, reduce peaks as a, as a long-term measure? Uh, I don't only think it lasts longer, I, 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 I'm paid for, uh, to, 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 to look after that it, that it takes uh, longer. But yes, it, it, it's hard working. I think it's hard working. It, it's also very important, I think, 
that the, 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 the chairman of, of, of the educational institutions, we have ambassadors mm -hmm. who, 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 who show that uh, uh, also they self work at home. And uh, in Groningen, we have uh, several uh, people who are uh, very um, uh, good working with us together to, uh, uh, to, to give the good example. Uh, okay. And I think when we all do, uh, that's a very uh, important. But there have to be uh, has to be a lot uh, of more the, 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 the national taxes, the local taxes, the uh, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. It, it's a very big uh, issue. But if we don't change uh, the behavior of mobility right now, I think in my career, I'm 62, I, I won't get a second chance. Thank you, Wilco. I think this is um, making very clear how important we have to use this COVID as a leverage situation uh, to make a real change. Um, there are still other questions popping up, but I will leave them for later. Uh, you can, of course, answer them in the chat if you want. But I, I do think we will all remember the zipper approach and we'll take them with us <laughs> in the future and take really this opportunity, as you tell us, Wilco. Um, I would like to thank you for your presentation and hope um, Katarina is ready uh, to tell us more about um, the nudging approach in general. The floor is yours, Katarina. Thank you so much. I will share my presentation too. Okay. Hi, everyone. Nice to uh, meet you, even if it's online, as everything is this year. My name is Katarina Pauli Brunat. I'm the CEO and founder of a company called Nudged, and I'm also the chair of the Nudging Sweden Network. And I'm going to talk about nudging for climate friendly travel habits. So that's what our company is passionate about. We do behavioral design for sustainability. So we work with the global SDGs, sustainable development goals, because behavioral challenges are everywhere in the sustainable development goals. And we've been working with mobility and travel habits for about five years now because nudging is our expertise. So, as I said, we are really, really passionate about making sustainable choices easy. And I think nudging is the method for that. So what we do is that we offer digital solutions that gives both a long lasting behavioral change um, that are evidence-based and that are hands-on solutions so that they can definitely give a greater return on investment in sustainability initiatives and also where we can measure the impact. Because we see that there is one big problem today when it comes to sustainability and mobility uh, overall. And it's that we spend on infrastructure and tech solutions, which is of course much needed and very good. But even if we spend so much money on infrastructure and tech solutions, we see that the behavioral change is still missing. And with the behavioral change missing, we cannot really leverage those results that we, that we need to. I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with the word and the method called nudging. Uh, we very often call it a friendly push, um, a nudge. It comes from the English word nudging. Uh, and um, it is what it is, as the, as the elephant mother here is giving you just this friendly, friendly push in the right direction. And the, the definition of it is that it's indirect suggestions that aim to influence the motives and decision making, but without legislation, carrots and sticks, and without monetary incentives. So I'm gonna give you a practical example, and then I'm gonna dig into how we can work more with mobility and digital nudging. So this is a, a case that we did in my hometown, the city of Gothenburg, uh, Sweden's second largest city. Uh, we did this a couple of years ago. As you know, the environment of public transport is also very much reflected on how many people actually use public transport. And the city of Gothenburg had a common problem a problem that we see in most cities today. They had a lot of litter. 
and specifically at the tram stops. So what we did was a nudge that you can read here, a sign saying, please put your cigarette butts in the ashtray over there because the pigeons are trying to quit smoking. And then you can see this poor pigeon that is wearing his nicotine patch and just needs some help from the citizens of Gothenburg. So instead of commonly punishments for, for littering, uh, we used humor, we used colorful design and a friendly messenger, this time a pigeon and not the municipality itself. And with this quite simple nudge, we could see a 70% better result. So this is a typical example on how you can use nudging as a method. But today I wanted to talk to you about nudging for smart travel habits and a digital platform that we have developed for this. Because we came across some interesting piece of research a few years ago, saying that 90% of all changes in car use is connected to a life event. What is a life event? It could be when you move or you get married, a baby is born, kids are moving out, you work on a new dog, new job, or maybe a global pand pandemic also. And what happens then? Well, there is this window of change that occurs and the so-called fresh start effect. So by using this type of psychological mechanism, we can use this fresh start effect and actually get a better result in the nudging activities that we want to do. So what we did is that we uh, built a digital uh, platform using the fresh start effect. And this is how it works. So it's a combination of use, the user needs their, uh, their phone and a web platform. So the user gets a text message or it could be an email with a very personalized link. You follow the link and you get into a web app using optimized nudges that are relevant for the specific user. So it's not one solution for everything, everyone. Every user gets their specific tailored uh, nudges, but it's all optimized. And then it's of course also automatically measured and analyzed. And I wanted to show you a bit more into this um, platform. The first thing that the user sees is a map. So let's say, that the user has just moved to a new city. The fresh start effect is there and you go into the platform and he or she could see, okay, here's my house, my address. Where's my closest bus stop? Why she or he could see, is there a car pool nearby? Is there a bike pool nearby? How can I buy a ticket for public transport? How far is it? If I want to take the bike to the city, how far do I get in 20 minutes? So all this is shown on the map. And we also has, um, have other relevant nudges specifically for the user. For example, using social norms messages, like this one, you could see, uh, did you know that 50% of your colleagues bike to work at least twice a week? Or it could be specific challenges, take your kids to school by walking or biking next week. Of course, this challenge would only occur for those having kids and not for the users not having kids. And you could also answer polls and, and different so, social norm messaging in, in different variations. For example, are you planning to start a new travel habit due to COVID-19? Just by clicking yes to this question, we could see that the user will actually also be more likely to start planning a new travel habit due to COVID-19. Because this, um, it's an indirect suggestion that makes the user more willing to actually do this behavioral change. So this is just a few examples of what you can find in the platform. So we did a, a study in Sweden in 2018 uh, with 4,800 people in four different municipalities. It was funded by the Swedish Energy Agency. And we wanted to know what the users think about actually having this type of information through a text message. Um, is that a good thing or is it too much when the city sends you text messaging? And 80% of the user group that left comment on this was actually positive towards uh, information through uh, text messaging. And only 2% chose to opt out. So it was much better result than we actually thought it would be saying that 
text messaging is not um, is an underutilized channel for cities to use with this type of, of information. We also got the results that the users were twice as positive towards walking, 76% more positive towards biking, and more than twice as positive towards public transport if you compare to taking a car when using this platform. When you look into the users that you know sometimes needs a car, uh, not everyone can live in the city center or have access to public transport. Um, of course, we want them to make the better choice of using their car, such as carpooling, car sharing, or switching to electric cars. And all the use, if you look at all the uses, we could see that 62% uh, of percent was more positive towards electric cars, hybrids, carpooling, or car sharing. And if we only dig into those who actually owned a diesel or a petrol car, we could see an even greater result, more than three times as positive towards changing to a more sustainable car behavior. So being positive about changing your behavior is one thing, but what about the actual behavioral change? Well, one third of the users in this study said that the platform had contributed to their current choice of transportation. And this was about a month after they start, first started to use the platform. And we also had an interesting find saying that three, it was three times more likely that men said so. So why would that be? Why would men be more positive towards this type of platform? We don't really know that yet. It might be that men are more positive towards digital solutions. Um, we don't know, but we are planning to find out because this was a, a very interesting point. I wanted to show you three success factors when using nudging as the method. First of all, uh, make sure it's evidence-based. Everything you do to change someone's behavior needs to be evidence-based. And how do we secure that? We work really, really close with academia. So this is our board of experts, a few of them. Uh, they are professors in behavioral science, psychology, environmental psychology, and mobility management, for example. The other success factor is to always measure the effect. Today, when climate change is, is happening in an exponential um, um, progress, we need to do something that we know has a measurable effect. We don't have time to do anything that doesn't work. So we build in this type of measuring and analysis in the platform where you also can get feedback from the users. And that's super um, important to always keep the platform up to date. And the third success factor would be don't choose between technology, infrastructure, uh, digital solutions, or behavioral psychology or, or behavioral change. They need to go hand in hand. So make sure that you design nudges that are automized and evidence-based, measurable, and also personalized, and nudges that are relevant to the user. So by using behavioral psychology combined with technology, you can get a much better result. So what's next? Um, well, Smart Travel Habits uh, has had a great year, the, the platform itself. First of all, we are in the middle of uh, our next study. We're doing one of the largest study in Northern Europe at this time, um, considered behavioral change for mobility. Uh, it's with 20,000 users in seven Swedish municipalities, also uh, funded by the Swedish Energy Agency. And also, uh, we have gotten the, the solar impulse label. And if you don't know what that is, it's the um, Solar Impulse Foundation that gives their label to efficient solutions. So we are one out of 1000 global solutions that has been appointed as an efficient solution for sustainability in the future. And we're really proud of that, of course. And moreover, we want to make more impact, of course. So we are looking for European cities and European municipalities and regions that wants to partner with us and see if we can change and make smart travel habits and more impact in that field. If you find this interesting, please connect with me either on social media uh, or through email. And if you think nudging and behavioral design is an interesting topic overall, 
um, feel free to sign up for our free newsletter. It's all in English um, uh, at nudge.io. So uh, thank you very much. Thanks to you, Katarina, for again a wonderful insight. I uh, I saw the um, reaction in the chat on the uh, presentation of Wilco that it was super insightful, which it was. <laughs> and again, this one was it as well. So I, I'm really happy with what we already heard. And of course, there are questions with this. And um, Pasquale, could you? Yes. So there is a first question. Do you know, uh, Katarina? Uh, the profile of the people using the platform, those willing to be nudged, uh, what type of, of mobility users they are? So we've been sent, we've been using the platform with uh, two types of, of users. One are people that has just moved, either they're moved into a new, um, new municipality or within the municipality. So of course they can be it could be families, it could be young people, it could be anyone. Uh, what they have in common is that they just recently moved. And that's when we can utilize that fresh start effect that I talked about. And the other type of user are uh, people in the workplace where um, we've done studies and we have clients that want to encourage their employees to uh, make more sustainable travel to, um, to work. So then, of course, we know that they are mostly working in an office building um, and that type of use that we have also done a lot. Okay, thanks. Then uh, a question also a bit similar, uh, also uh, regarding the users. How do you recruit these users? Are the ones participating not already, uh, not already really interested in these topics and willing to change? Yeah, so the thing is that they don't need to sign up at yeah. all. Uh, when we work with the cities and regions, uh, we can get their contact details. Um, so basically we have, uh, it's open data in, in Sweden where we can get a hold of their phone numbers so that we can send them this text message, message without them having them sign up beforehand. And when we work with workplaces, it's of course um, emails and phone numbers are a part of their employee information. Okay, then I guess you answered the other uh, question, how many users the platform have? Can you remind us? Um, we have, right now, I think we are up in 15,000 mm -hmm. users. Um, we're aiming for 20,000 in by the end of Q1 okay. in the spring. And then there is another interesting question about uh, the, uh, how effective is the approach? So is this approach effective in every country? differences in uh, attitude towards policy messages on behalf of the government yeah how you do so, you know? yeah that's why i'm here today because we want to test that so far we only tested it in sweden and now we're looking for partners in the rest of europe to see could this also be an international uh platform that can work in, in other cultures and other countries okay I think that's an open invitation from your side, Katarina, to all the participants in this group. So the ones that feel uh, um, comfortable with this question, please do, do join uh, or do link with Katarina um, now or later. That's up to you. Um, we will leave the other questions for later, Katarina, if that's okay. And um, uh, I hope Michiel is ready to, uh, to talk about nudging in Antwerp. The floor is yours, Michiel. <laughs> Thank you. I will share my screen. Uh, so good afternoon. My name is Michiel. I uh, work for the city of Antwerp in Belgium. That's a city with about half a million uh, in inhabitants. For the city of Antwerp, I follow up um, the campaigns and communication of urban development and mobility. And so today I'm here to talk to you about how we do communications and campaigns about mobility with our brand, which is called Smart Ways to Antwerp. Um, yeah, so our ambition uh, in Antwerp, this is the ring road around uh, our city, is to go for a modal shift. To, so let people move from uh, cars to more sustainable ways of transport. And we do that by two kinds of measures. First of all, hard measures, for example, cycling paths, building parking rights, and so on. And with soft measures, think about communications, think about events we organize, uh, con um, connection we make with, uh, for example, car sharing uh, um, providers in Antwerp and so on. Uh, this presentation will go uh, about the soft 
measures uh, most. So how do we approach behavioral change in Antwerp? It's with a, a theoretical model, it's called the 7E model, and I will try to talk you through uh, during this session. So of course we start with uh, envisioning, which means we think about our segmentation, which are our target groups, how can we uh, approach uh, those target groups. And to do that, uh, we have this funnel here. We look at people who are in a different stage uh, of, uh, let's say, behavioral change. Starting with people who don't know that there like, is anything going on. So for example, they're stuck in traffic every day, and it's okay for them. People, other people are uh, aware of the fact that they're stuck in traffic, that it's not what they want, but that's it. Uh, one step further, they're worried, thinking like, hmm, this is not really something that I like. But then, and we're going through the funnel here, next step is they have an insight. So for example, they're in their car, uh, stuck in traffic, they see somebody passing by with their electrical bike, or they see a train passing by, they think this might be interesting for me, uh, because it seems like this is a good solution, like those people are going faster. And the next step is, of course, they have the intention. So for example, they say, if the weather is good, I will try to go to work with an electrical bi bike. Or if the meeting that I have in the morning is a bit later, I can try the train and so on. The next step in the funnel here is test behavior, which means they are trying to go by bike. They are uh, uh, going by train, they are testing, they are checking if it's something for them. And so let's hope that then they go to the uh, last step in the funnel, which is fixed behavior and where people really uh, use the car less and use sustainable ways of transport more. So, but how do we push people to this funnel? That's with our um, 7E model, which is surrounding here. It's enthusing, enthusing people, encouraging them, engaging, exp giving them experiences, enabling them, exemplifying and enlightening. And I will give you an example of every E during this session. And in the end, of course, we evaluate to improve. Okay, so uh, how do we put these seven E in campaigns? Um, the first E is enlightening. That's giving information. That's something that every government does. I saw that there are quite a lot of people uh, here working for governments. Let's just say the basic thing uh, every government does. So for example, here is a campaign about big roadworks in the center of Antwerp, and we're informing people. We're saying the roadworks will start at that date, and if you want to approach Antwerp, you can do it by that, that, of the, or that way. So that's enlightening, giving information. Another is engaging, where we show ambassadors who have the right behavior. So for example, this here is uh, Kuhn. Uh, he takes his foldable bike to go to a sharing car and then go to his office. But he also uses, of course, the bike to go to a train or to go to a bus and so on. And so we show this video on our social media. We show this ambassador for people to get inspired. So we have a lot of ambassadors with, for example, also logistic solutions, uh, but also a lot of people living in Antwerp really showing how they can move on a sustainable way what the right behavior is to inspire other people. Another E is uh, encourage. So we um, reward people. We have a, a discount solution for people who want to buy an electrical bike, which can be quite expensive. So if they buy an electrical bike and they uh, start using their car less and they can prove that to us, they get a discount of around 200 euros for buying the electrical bike, which is a way of really shifting their behavior from cars towards uh, more cycling. Exemplifying, let me try the same. Uh, here you can see a, a pre-COVID picture that's obvious of an event uh, where we put a lot of CEOs in one room and we let them talk to each other about how in their companies they are uh, implementing uh, an, a good mobility um, let's say a way of acting with mobility and how they push their employees towards sustainable mobility. And so by doing that, uh, they started listening to each other. Uh, the CEOs they were thinking, hmm, I might be able to do better than the other one. So that's exactly what we wanted. We wanted to give them the feeling, I will try the same, I will even do better. And by putting all those CEOs in the room, we believe that we can have really an effect in, uh, in the Antwerp region. Then uh, we have the E of enabling, making it easy for people, give them incentives. This connects a bit to uh, the previous speaker, to what Katrina uh, said, because uh, in Antwerp we have uh, an application and a website with a route planner, um, and we yeah, use it to nudge people. So for example, if you uh, search for a route from Hirkra Beke to the center of Antwerp, you will get quite a lot of options there. 
But compared to Google Maps, the uh, option won't be like the fastest one. You will see the smartest route or the cheapest route. And uh, people can, for example, click on one of the routes, then see uh, how they can go to the uh, center of Antwerp. But then, of course, um, we include options as, for example, folding bikes, e-bikes, um, and shared bikes, shared mobility systems, and so on. But not everybody um, uh, is able to use them or not everybody has a subscription on them. So people can uh, say which transport options they want to see. They can say, I want to see options using a bike, using an e-bike, using a bus, using water mobility and so on. So we really try, and if you're in the application, of course, and if your profile is there, we know which solutions we can show. So really try to give people an answer to their specific situation to uh, move towards Antwerp. Another thing we have uh, is this, you can put a pin on where you live. So this is Antwerp, this is where I live. And if I put a pin here, I can see in five minutes walking distance, all the, uh, let's say, smart uh, mobility solutions that are around me. So for example, there are e-steps of the bird system here. There is a car sharing here. There are um, uh, bicycles, sharing bicycles here. I can click on the icon. If I'm on the website, you can, of course, try it. It's also in English, so please uh, go ahead. It's Smart Ways to Antwerp. So I can click on the icon and see how many bikes are available. Uh, there are buses, there are trams, and so on. So it, it really gives the impression of, let's say, on only five minutes walking distance, which uh, options are there. Um, then we also, I will uh, let the video play while I continue talking. We also, like the next ease in choosing people, we want to make an emo emotional connection to people. Um, and we do that, for example, with this kind of videos where uh, here is a mother saying that she likes to take uh, the bike uh, to school for her children every day because it gives her a kind of freedom. And of course, she also tells that it's not always easy, but that she really loves to do it. This guy here is telling that he uh, likes to take our sharing bike system because the only pollution then is uh, by breathing out. And so we put like a few reasons in a video like this. Uh, this is, for example, I can go to work, stop for a coffee and uh, go on. I couldn't do that when I go by car. It always ends with why would you use uh, your bicycle more? So it's uh, this kind of approach we have there. Then another way of choosing people is by a campaign, which is called the Make the Shift campaign. Uh, a campaign. I said uh, in the beginning that the modal shift is our target. So let's say the slogan, Make the Shift, uh, really uh, connects to that one. And the campaign looks like this. So actually, it's more, let's say, a heroic campaign. But heroism here isn't found in the big heroic, heroic things, but in the small ones. So here, for example, in uh, having a trouser clip, which prevents your uh, trouser from getting into your chain uh, and so on. So what's written here is one small step for you is a giant leap for the city. So if you enter a tram, it's a small step, but you really uh, help the city forward. So make the shift and take the tram to Antwerp. I will show you some uh, measurements, some conclusion about this campaign later on. Then we also uh, give people experiences. It's the last E I will talk to you about. So positive experience. So we have this car-free day every year. Uh, and during that day, people are really able to uh, try out a lot of uh, smart ways, a lot of smart mobility options in the uh, city of Antwerp. So this day, this uh, possibility for them to have experience, we think is really useful to push people to, uh, to sorry, this uh, yeah, fixed uh, behavior. The Wheel of Fortune, where people can get, for example, some free minutes to use uh, uh, e-steps and so on. So. Um, how do we evaluate? How do we measure all these things? For example, uh, we measure our campaign reach. In the last campaign, the one that I showed you, the Make the Shift campaign, the reach was not as good as we expected. Um, but that's connected to Corona. We used a lot of, uh, let's say, posters in the streets. And of course, mobility was less. People were moving less toward the, uh, through the city. So in the future, we learned that uh, in, let's say, COVID-19, in Corona times, we will use other uh, media uh, to approach people. But if we then look to people, if we show them the campaign, what the message take out is, we really see um, that they are quite good in knowing the fact that it's a mobility campaign. Um, and if they don't know or if they're not happy with the campaign, if they don't get the message we want to tell them, uh, 7% of them says that it's like with underlying issues, that they're, for example, not happy with public transport. So that's a, an interesting message to take out, I guess. And then we also measure the campaign appreciation. Is it clear, well-made, informative, useful, and original? 
it was the first time we did this campaign. The results are good, but there are still, uh, let's say, space for improvement. So we'll now uh, brief our creative agency to make it better, uh, to make these uh, numbers better by, uh, let's say, the next campaign we will do. Then we have our brand, Smart Ways to Antwerp. Our website, of course, has to be well known for people to go there and to really find uh, mobility solutions. So we measure how many people know uh, Smart Ways to Antwerp. Living in the city of Antwerp, by the way, it's about around 93%, of which 50% says that they are well informed. So these are, I think, quite good numbers for uh, Smart Ways to Antwerp. My last slide will be about the modal split. Uh, I will focus on people living in Antwerp going to work from 2010 to 2019 by car. It's the orange line drops from 51% to 42%. And uh, cycling went up from 21% to 35%. So when it comes to that, I think we're doing uh, quite well. So that was it. Are there uh, any questions about this? Uh, thank you, Michiel, for this extensive uh, explanation on how Antwerp is working towards a shift, a sustainable modal shift and a mental as well, using the seven E's. Um, I don't see any question in the chat. Maybe I'm wrong, but I have one for you. Um, there are a lot of E's, seven, in fact. <laughs> um, if you had to choose, because a city sometimes cannot do everything, what would you recommend? Um, because Antwerp is a big city, so maybe with more possibilities than a smaller one. Um, what would you recommend uh, other uh, local authorities? I think it's very hard to uh, to choose one E. So I guess governments mostly um, get stuck on the enlightening E, to give information to people. So a government thinks if you give a lot of information to people and they know, for example, that the roadworks are coming up or there are traffic jams, that people automatically change their behavior. Uh, but I don't think uh, that's the case. So I guess uh, the most important thing is to think about creative ways to uh, use all the E's that are available. But of course, um, it can be quite expensive to really, you know, uh, use them all. So maybe uh, thinking about how you can, on a creative way, use like a lot of E's, that's quite important. So I would say not to focus on one E, but try to find something for every E and really get a, a total package uh, there to approach people. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And looking for the elephant there that pushes as well people in the right direction, as Katarina told us. Uh, meanwhile, there is a question, uh, Pasquale, I will take it uh, since I'm there. Uh, there is a question, how do you measure how many people know the project? Uh, how did you reach them? Uh, was it a questionnaire, social media? How did you do that? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, like the numbers that I showed, uh, mm -hmm. those are from uh, a survey we do for people living in Antwerp. So we send them uh, a link to this questionnaire and about 1,000 people answer the question. So it's mm -hmm. a quite big survey. So we really know that those numbers, like the numbers that I showed, are, let's say, representative for people uh, living in Antwerp. Okay, yeah, I saw the response. So that's quite high. So that's that's nice and that's, I suppose, um, uh, positive for the future steps that the city wishes to take uh, because there's still some potential, I think. <laughs> yeah. <in> a... <laughs> Absolutely. But also, like, because this was focused on, let's say, the city of Antwerp, people living in the city of Antwerp. Mm -hmm. uh, also, like, but we didn't do it this year because of uh, COVID-19. But other years, we also do surveys in the whole of Flanders, like in the other cities, too, to really see how people look at smart ways to Antwerp. So this was actually a quite small survey we did mm -hmm. with still mm -hmm. thousand uh, people responding. Yeah in these challenging COVID times. Well, thank you, Michiel. I think other questions will pop up, uh, questions will pop up later, uh, but I think it's time to uh, listen to the last speaker. Um, so, Maren, please join the floor. It's all yours. Hi, thank you. I'm also going to share my screen. Um, I also want to express a bit of gratitude uh, in that I was invited here, and I also want to thank all the other speakers uh, and you, uh, Els and Pasquale, too. Um, so I want to start uh, real quick by uh, a small anecdote, which is if you actually Google the top uh, most congested cities and ring roads uh, in the world, depending on which website you end up, uh, you'll see Antwerp at number one and Brussels on number two and then LA uh, maybe on number three or the other way around. Um, so just to say that Brussels and Antwerp are two um, really, really congested uh, car traffic cities. 
Um, and so uh, Michiel looked at the Antwerp case. I'm going to be looking at the um, Brussels case. Um, that's because um, I'm Marijn Straf. Uh, I am the spokesman and the communication manager here at the Werkvernootschap. Um, we're an organization uh, founded by the Flemish government. So uh, while Michiel was talking about a, a city government, uh, we work for the Flemish government. Um, uh, we were only founded in 2016, so we're a very new organization. Uh, and we're in charge of these really large and, and really complex uh, mobility infrastructure projects that often have this long winded history um, that are really, really um, tough to, to actually realize that sometimes the government's been trying to for over 40 years, uh, but it, it doesn't work. Government comes up with something, stakeholders go to the courts and it, it, it gets um, destroyed and, and then nothing happens. And so these projects are um, all given to us. We have six or seven of them across the country. Um, but our biggest one is uh, without a doubt, um, the ring road around Brussels. So um, the, the Brussels ring road is, like I said, one of the most congested um, highways in the world. Also, if you look at um, the European statistics of um, incidents and accidents, also one of the most dangerous highways um, because there's a lot of um, on-ramps and off-ramps on a very short amount of space. Uh, and so with this project, the Flemish government is trying to uh, invest in, in 20 kilometers of, uh, of new uh, ring road. Um, but not only that, there's, there's about 60 kilometers of new bicycle highways and there's also 60 kilometers uh, of um, new uh, open, um, um, public transportation. Uh, so that's all the green lines and then there's the orange lines. Those are all the um, bike uh, highways. And so um, there's a little bit of a context needed for people who are not from Belgium, which is that the Flemish government is actually um, the proprietor of this road. Um, whereas the Brussels government, which is a separate government, um, is actually uh, in charge of everything that's, that's in Brussels itself. And this uh, ring road is just um, outside of the, the the periphery of Brussels, which is why it is uh, the Flemish government that's in charge. And so um, I also want to uh, really take a glance back at Michiel because uh, Smart Ways to Antwerp is, is an exemplary project and, and everyone uh, in, in Flanders, I think, is, is really, um, really happy with that. And it's it's a very, or everyone in the industry knows it and it's, it's kind of the standard. And so what I'm going to talk about is something that we are trying to do to get to that um, same level. Uh, but we're not there yet. It's also, because you know the city of Antwerp is investing a lot in, in smart ways to Antwerp, whereas we here have to work with Brussels. There's kind of a political thing going on between Flanders and Brussels, so it's not always that easy. Um, but that will lead us a little bit too far. So what I'm here to talk about is our new mobility network, um, which is something that uh, in 2018 we came up with because we saw that in all our communications and, and participations that we were doing, uh, we, we were kind of missing out on companies and organizations. Um, and so we, we said, well, why don't we try to um, come up with this kind of network initiative for companies and organizations where they can meet each other uh, throughout activities and, and seminars and congresses and stuff um, and, and try to get them to think about the sustainable and the future-proof mobility. Um, and so it's, it's basically because of this giant um, roadworks project that is going to happen within the next five or 10 years, um, that we are already now looking at companies that are in this um, area to try and, and yeah, really think about future-proof um, mobility. Uh, so there's three main pillars. Uh, we do a yearly conference um, with about 150 people. Um, of course, we didn't do one in 2020. This is all pre-COVID-19. Uh, um, I'll tell you more about the conferences later. Um, we have uh, three mobility coaches. Um, who we as a Flemish government, we pay them 75% of their salary and they go out, they identify big companies uh, in the Brussels ring road periphery. And they, um, yeah, they basically go knocking on their door and they're like, well, what are you doing today to uh, improve your uh, mobility towards something that's future proof and sustainable? And they will help them. They will uh, make a plan. They will start with a broad survey company wide and then they'll um, make a whole plan and, and really go to the management and try to implement that and support them with that as well. And so it's us as Flemish government uh, trying to um, basically do something uh, that these companies would not be doing from uh, themselves. Our third pillar, um, which is that we do uh, a project call um, for innovative, innovative uh, solutions uh, also in this area around Brussels. Uh, and I was looking at the people who are in this session and I saw uh, someone who I think is on this picture uh, Sihirt, um, who uh, is from Taxi Stop, and who uh, also got a, 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 a funding of, of one of his projects. So this is uh, 20 projects applied. Um, I think we selected nine projects and gave in total uh, a grant of 365,000 euros. Uh, and it goes from really small projects, um, small um, bike consultants that want to go to small companies to try to get their employees on a bike. 
but also, for example, there's um, um, integration of a parking app uh, with uh, ticketing for public transportation. There's um, um, big um, park operators for big company sites that want to um, put together um, logistical transport and so all this stuff and we try to give them uh, a little bit of financial support so that uh, this area can support innovative growth uh, when it comes to mobility. Um, what is uh, innovative about this, I think, um, what's important is, and this slide is in Dutch for which I'm sorry, but um, this kind of shows um, for each um, group of people that we identify um, how um, we approach them um, for the whole of the um, Brussels Ring Road um, Roadworks project. And so what I think is important to, to know um, is that traditionally, and especially not in Belgium, uh, when a government has tried to do really big, and I'm talking like three billion plus roadworks projects, they've usually always failed. And, and we're looking at Antwerp now where it's finally starting to happen. And there's really been a paradigm shift where um, we've seen that, that participation and communication and looking for a broad public support has become way more important over the last 10, 15 years. And so when we as an organization were founded in 2016, it was really in our DNA. So in the, 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 the legal documents that are founding us as an organization, it says that we will um, put a lot of time, effort and money into this, this broad participatory approach. And so we're really doing that. And we, we start to see also not, not um, just for this Brussels project, but also for other projects that has been, for example, one in Limburg where uh, they've been trying to do something for 40, 60 years and it's never worked. And now we see that because we started from scratch with everybody around the table, um, this participatory approach is, I think, one that governments um, around Europe can no longer ignore. And so it's super important to, uh, to start focusing in on that. Um, not only that, it, but also something we do is with the new mobility network, we try to offer companies uh, all these things that, that have a benefit for them. Um, for example, a new one that we're trying to do this year, uh, next year, um, sorry, is on the bottom right, which is a test fleet of um, e-bikes. Uh, so we bought 25 um, high, high quality e-bikes, uh, different kinds, foldable ones, bigger ones, uh, the ones where you can put your children in the front or the back, um, e-steps as well. And we uh, loan them out to companies that uh, are in our network and they can give them to their employees for a couple of weeks uh, just to see if it will be something for them. And if indeed they try to pull the trigger afterwards, we um, go, uh, we go, we send our mobility coaches to them and they can help with all the um, administrative support needed to implement uh, e-bikes. Um, and so we, we do, um, besides our big conferences, we also do smaller uh, seminars, um, these what we call work sessions where you can uh, learn about these really specific things for as a company to sh make a shift towards um, uh, future-proof mobility. Um, what have we achieved? Well, um, we obviously haven't achieved as much as, uh, as Michiel has with, with the uh, Antwerp, uh, Smart Ways to Antwerp. That's been uh, going for a lot longer and, and they have uh, a lot more uh, um, things to deal with, I think. Um, but what we're doing is these coaches, they are, uh, they're really, I, I really wanted to, uh, to show you this. Um, they're really working on um, going to companies, trying to tell them to, one, if you can, avoid um, your employees' displacement. If it has to happen, make it green, make it sustainable, uh, make it four days instead of five, for example. Um, make sure everything is safe. Um, try to use alternatives if you haven't. Um, and then we uh, saw that in year one, so that's uh, 2019, um, we saw that uh, on the ring road itself, um, because we did surveys in the beginning and at the end uh, with six, with just six companies uh, and our mobility coaches at those companies um, for quite a bit of time, uh, we managed to do uh, 415 cars less uh, every day on the um, Brussels Ring Road. Um, it's, it's not a lot and we're, we definitely know that we're not going to solve uh, all of the problems by ourselves and we don't, uh, we don't say that we will. Um, but if you look at you know, a small 500 cars out of maybe 45, 50,000, it, it's it's just a little bit that might get it going. And then if other companies start to look at, at, at each other, and, and so that's kind of, um, you know, we, we try to, um, we're gonna expand this, we're gonna keep this going. So in our starting year, um, that's kind of a kind of a nice result. Um, we're very happy with that. Um, we did two conferences. Our first one was called, Are You Future Proof? Um, where we looked at the future of, of uh, mobility. The second one was about logistical transport and Brussels as a logistical hub. Um, where we also did uh, um, an, uh, 
a visit to uh, a, the port of Brussels where they had a new kind of um, ship unloading a specific kind of containers that was way more sustainable than um, putting it on trucks on the road. Um, and so, yeah, we, we try to do a lot of things uh, to keep these companies interested so that they will just make um, the in, in almost intuitive um, change to uh, a future-proof mobility. Um, this is our uh, project call that was picked up by local news, which is always nice to see, um, was on a local TV channel. Um, so that's always nice for us as, a, as an organization um, to show that we're also working um, not just on um, trying to pour concrete on a, on, a, on a roadworks project, but also way, way broader than that, trying to think about um, future-proof uh, mobility. Um, so some of the lessons uh, learned then, uh, I guess, which is kind of important is that uh, this new mobility network really focuses on companies and organizations. Um, and it's, it's hard for us to sometimes engage them because the first question they ask is, well, when are these really big roadworks going to start? And we have to answer, well, it's gonna take probably four or five more years. And the most uh, common reply you get is, well, then come back to me in three and a half or four years when it's actually going to happen. Um, and so that's kind of kind of hard to keep these companies engaged. You know, they have other things to worry about. Right now, there's a big crisis they have to worry about. So what we're trying to do is make an engaging program of activities, um, make it also uh, a peer-to-peer -peer thing where they can learn from each other. Um, so we try to stay close to them. Um, we take the game to their court. Um, we speak uh, their language and show them how they can benefit also right now. Um, so before we have to start some, some really big roadworks that are gonna um, probably cause delays and traffic jams even much more than today. Um, and so we wanna sh get to these companies today and ask them, uh, you know, what can you do right now to make sure that you're prepared for when we arrive with our bulldozers to mess up basically the, the, the main artery of the country when it comes to um, traffic. So that's all I have. Um, I think my time is also up, so that was quite um, well thought out uh, else. So uh, that's it, I guess. Um, you can visit our website uh, as a last uh, remark, but it's uh, in Dutch only for now. Um, but still, I hope um, some of you will. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Marijn, for this quick introduction on how Brussels is dealing with uh, big challenges. And it's no coincidence, I think, that we have two Belgian speakers <laughs> in this session because um, there is a lot of work out there. Uh, I would like all the speakers to get into the arena again. Um, and that, Marin, maybe you can stop uh, sharing your screen. Then everybody gets on the screen. Yes. Um, because now it's up to you, the audience, with some thoughtful questions. Um, I'm sure they are. It's clear that for all the speakers this afternoon, um, there are a lot of challenges before us. And with a little um, with some pushes, nudges, as Katharina told us, um, with some ease, like Neil <laughs> explained, but also with zipper reflections. I won't forget that one. And some great stakeholder ma management, because I think, Maren, that's the, the strength also of, of your network. We will have to get there. Um, and it's not an or question. It's not or infrastructure or or Katarina. You were really clear about that. It's an end question, and I saw a really interesting question about that um, in the chat about if there are studies available about around this efficiency uh, thing um, of a modal shift. Only infrastructure, only campaigning, only nudges, or a combination. Are there studies, or are you aware of studies um, getting into it? Um, I saw that question too, and I would love to to hear someone else about that. I, I know a lot of studies, you know, on nudging and nudging co combined with infrastructure, but not. I haven't seen a study specifically comparing different mm -hmm. um, incentives. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anyone else who's seen that? Yeah, like in, in, in Antwerp, let's say, uh, the, the infrastructure, because I heard Brussels saying that the infrastructural work, works sorry, are coming up. In Antwerp, we're really facing uh, quite big roadworks already. So uh, the question for campaigning and communication was 
like obvious we we couldn't we couldn't not say anything to the people people are stuck in traffic we would have have big issues on our uh, uh, ring roads so we really uh, yeah we couldn't do anything else than then start communicating to give people uh, other ways of coming to antwerp so i think it was more or less an answer on the infrastructural uh, things we were facing uh, but in the end it's uh, interconnected i, co I don't mm -hmm. think you can see them um, um, not connected to each other yeah mm -hmm. Yeah, but it is an interesting research question that I completely agree. <laughs> uh, thank you. Um, uh, Klaas Jan, you have the question I had top of my mind is again, again, how do you cope with COVID with all your um, projects? Because a lot of companies have other priorities now than sustainability, although it's of course very important, but there are just other challenges. Um, and how can you still trigger with all your initiatives? How can you trigger them to work on this uh, topic? Um, and I think, so, I hope all of you have a, have some thoughts about that. Um, so I, I think it's a very, um, very good question. And, and mm -hmm. most of my presentation was actually focused on the time before COVID. Um, but I think right now with what's happening, um, of course, you have a lot of mostly smaller and middle-sized businesses that are in big, big problems. Luckily for us, we're, we're mostly focused on, on the really big companies, so large consultancy firms, for example, um, large manufacturers that are around the areas, because what we do kind of only starts having its effect if there are a lot of employees in, in one company. And so what we're doing is we're shifting our, our, um, our, our, our focus from, for example, um, the change from the car to public transport to also um, doing the teleworking and working from home and trying to um, you know, write articles about that and, and see what are some benefits, what are maybe some downsides of now you know, being so much at home and working from there. And so we, we still try to trigger them like that, but we also try to make them realize that there is going to be a world after COVID where you know, their consultants will have to get on the road again. And, and, you know, and so hopefully it all gets back to some degree of normalcy. Um, but that's kind of, you know, obviously it's been a big, really big um, issue and, and, and problem. And it's hard to go to a company right now and, and ask them about sustainable mobility when, you know, they have obviously way bigger issues at hand, mm -hmm. but there's there's still a part that, that, that we can do. And, and so that's what we're focusing on. Okay. I don't know, Wilco or Katarina or Michiel, you have something no, to see, add to uh, that? Uh, uh, uh. Yeah, I have uh, I have something uh, to add. Uh, yeah, I recognize the, the question. Uh, not all doors are open right now for our um, mobility uh, uh, stories, but mm -hmm. when they are listening, we, uh, it's also about money. Two examples. Uh, first, the Dutch, uh, oh no, no, the Swedish company Sweco. I have to say, Swed it's a Swedish company, uh, mm -hmm. Katharina, uh, in a session in uh, in Groningen. And they, uh, they said for, uh, for Holland, uh, they, uh, uh, the, 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 the benefit was 20. What we're doing now, now with COVID. So money, Sweco, doesn't have to pay out for mobility mesh. Mm -hmm. money. Example two is that uh, already uh, uh, in uh, uh, the, the total of parts of the real estate uh, at home uh, and they have to hire uh, uh, or to buy uh, less uh, square meters for uh, real estate. There are two uh, mm -hmm. examples about money. Okay, and you think that's encouraging or <laughs> we do have to look for other ease or other nudges to to really get to the goal? Like no, it's, it's also uh, uh, the, the, the companies are going uh, bankrupt, but mm -hmm. it's always okay. also about uh, 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 less. Mm-hmm. Mm, that's true. I see you nodding, uh, Katarina. <laughs> yeah, I have something to add to this. I think that, um, of course, COVID has brought many things that is both confusing and not good at all. 
But I think we also need to see the opportunity here and the window of change that I talked about. Uh, we do know that there will be a time after COVID and it's the perfect opportunity to utilize the fresh start effect and to build back better because we all need that. So we don't need when it's, we don't know when it's going to happen, but we can all agree we know it will be happen. It will happen. So what can we do meanwhile is to prepare to actually put the nudge when it's needed with the best timing possible. And um, one thing that that we also need to realize is that the the most climate friendly travel habit you can have is to not travel at all. True. So. So what can we do in order for how, how people, how can people behave in, in this new, this new norm that we're all facing? Um, so we, what we have, we're in the middle of actually transforming a module of our platform from the Smart Travel Habits platform into only Smart Habits platform, because also to help with work environment and remote work and how can we have this combined mobility where you might not have to travel as much as you did before mm -hmm. and, also, and how can we nudge people when they're in their home yeah and not only yeah okay thank you michiel is enter of thinking also future proof there yeah we try to yes uh, the, i want to say to katrina yeah if people don't move that's also that's of course the best solution so uh, we will try to support uh, the companies uh, that are connected to smart waste to antwerp we'll try to support them to uh, make sure that their working at home policies will be future proof so that the COVID situation can be a start to let more people work at home. I think if uh, less people are moving afterwards uh, or are moving on other moments, so for example, the first meeting uh, is at home uh, digitally and then they move to the office, it could also be a solution. So I think uh, we really have to uh, look at that, how we can uh, yeah, keep that on a sustainable way in the, in the transport approach. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and and I think that's why Pasquale put the, the next question in the chat. Uh, if you ha are aware of some um, examples of organizations, companies uh, already capitalizing this this opportunity of uh, uh, remote working as a nudging <laughs> uh, initiative um, to avoid this probably um, unnecessary yeah. trips to 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 the office. Mm -hmm. A simple question. Yes, uh, we oh, do. Just share. <laughs> so, for example, we do. Um, so, we help a lot of companies with that, uh, with that transformation. And also, I, I read in the news just in Sweden two days ago this uh, this big Swedish company who who just have have a new complete new policy around remote working and how they can how they use nudging as a method to make that make that happen and make that behavioral change um, transition. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know, Maren or Wilco. I don't see you, Wilco. So please, <laughs> let's talk if you have also something to add there. Um, I mean, I think the educational institutions you're working with are, are already a good example. Isn't it? I don't they hear you, Wilco. Example, but it's, uh, it's not the only example uh, we mm -hmm. have. We've also uh, uh, healthcare uh, institutions. Okay. Which, because of COVID, uh, COVID now uh, know that some of uh, healthcare can uh, can be done at a distance. You don't have, uh, the, the the doctor and the, the patient That's don't have each other all. The time. I don't say never again. No, all the time. <laughs> and so we are living in a period that even the the healthcare sector recognizes that. And I think. Uh, that uh, fatality is uh, uh, health. Fatality health is, is a very important issue. And that's also marketing and campaigning, uh, uh, promoting uh, uh, cycling is mm -hmm. good for uh, for the ability of the city of Groningen. Health for uh, etc cetera, etc. Cetera. So I think. You have to to look for what is what is the the best urge your city or at this moment to to uh, to tell the story. Mm -hmm. uh, 
thank you. Yeah, thank you. Because Because I'm sorry. (laughs) <laughs> that's okay that's okay um and then of course there is this uh, remark in the chat that home office is also a huge chance for rural areas um which can help them to slow down or even reverse the depopulation and, and becoming attractive again um how do you feel about that i feel like that's kind of interesting because one of the one of the downsides of of this really increased teleworking and maybe you know if it sustains itself into the to the long future especially looking at flanders like we messed up our our mobility you know at one but also spatial planning is is horrible in flanders it's it's just there's there's no logic behind it it was all modularly implemented and is there's just no you know there's no reason behind it and i think increased teleworking will lead to people maybe not being so, um, um, yeah, um, um, implied to to move closer to their work, you know. So I think one of the one of the main um, bene- benefits, like company cars, way back when, were actually taxed on how far you had to drive to work, and so now the the Flemish government is implementing these tax breaks. If you live close enough to work, you can get your mortgage paid off with your mobility budget from your uh, employer and stuff. So yeah, while these rural areas can also, you know, maybe redevelop themselves where they're dying out, I think another question is, do we really want that to happen to a certain degree? Because our spatial planning is so messed up and it's affecting our mobility. And I'm by no means a, everyone needs to live in a city type of person. But I, I think that's that's also a question worth asking. So it's you see, there's a big balance and it, it's not all like, happy things with with more teleworking absolutely i don't know how the others think about that katarina (laughs) can i tell you i can tell you an example from a small village up north of the polar circle in northern sweden very rural rural area close to finland and there i think they are like 100 150 people in the village and they have been known for um, a great developing community. So uh, a really high percentage of the people living in the city have their own companies and work as uh, within the tech field or as developers. So they can basically do their work wherever in the in the world and also keep their traditions and keep and stay where their family and their generations ha- has been for many, many, many years. Um, uh, so I think it's a wonderful opportunity to see that the rest of the world is also seeing this as a as a what it is an opportunity and not all, also all bad. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I see some comments in the chat. Um, you see them as well, huh? because of course home office has negative and positive effects, um, and maybe there is a lot of research to be done huh? in this in this period of time in this very cheap, strange times, uh, because of course. Home office is uh, linked to transportation, mobility, but also to um, shops, bars, etc., in city centers, to urban sprawl or not the urban sprawl. And, and of course, all is linked, uh, spatial planning with mobility. Um, it's a, a demand and answer uh, <laughs> uh, vices uh, circle. Um, I don't know, Michiel, how Antwerp is dealing already with that or thinking about it? It's quite interesting. The the person in charge in Antwerp of mobility is also the person in charge of shops. In uh, in uh, so he doesn't really like it when we say work at home, don't come to the city. <laughs> okay. Um, but also, there, we, we don't have any uh, let's say numbers or anything about that. But personally, I don't believe that people will work for, will work for, from home for five days a week. It will be one or two days a week probably. And so this is good for mobility. And this is also good for a city because the city will still live. People will still come here, still come here to work, still come here to live. So I think it's uh, leveling out more or less. So it's not like uh, post COVID, nobody will get in their cars anymore. Everybody will work at home. I think everybody who has been working at home the past few weeks, months, uh, knows that you need some contact with people uh, that that's necessary. So I guess, uh, it will uh, level out uh, on yeah, level out a bit. <laughs> I hope so. Yeah. yeah, I think we all have to hope at least uh, that that um, the positive leverage uh, COVID is here is there um, 
in the framework of mobility that we have to use it. Um, and so I was wondering, we're approaching the end of the session, um, if there is some highlight or some lesson learned or insight from the last months that you really would like to take forward in your work uh, or give it to the participants. Um, yeah, because it's really something we could use um, to change people's behavior because now they have this experience of yeah, being more at home, being locked <laughs> a little bit. Um, because it's like a fresh start, maybe, like you told us, Katarina. One thing that I, I see is, I, I also believe that we, we will have this type of mixed mobility where we work from home a few days and we maybe go to an office or at least a co-working space. Mm -hmm. um, so, but I think that the, the perception of when is working hours will hopefully uh, have a uh, slight change and that will also have a positive effect on, on mobility specifically in cities um but the learning i would like to bring forward is i see a lot of people and also a lot of research saying that we finally find the connection to nature more again because people have once again maybe been working from home, as I said, or being out walking more in nature because the, the gyms are closed or the, the what they normally do for hobbies closed down. So, and also we can see that the the interest in gardening is uh, skyrocketing and those kind of things. So, uh, um, and when we become more close to nature, we also get a bigger holistic perspective on, on everything uh, globally and why why are our travel habits connected to that yes because we can see that there are other uh, means in life and other we can also try to change mm -hmm. and see if we can find new things like biking or walking mm -hmm. instead of taking the car so i think that's one positive thing that i we can embrace uh, and help people to embrace more okay thank you and that policy makers even on city level can take forward mm -hmm. in their policy making as well i think Thank you, um, Maren, Michiel, or Wilco. Yeah, I, I think you know a, a big a big takeaway from this whole uh, COVID nineteen thing. Not that it's gone by now, but just the fact that all of these things are are possible. You know, like I remember the twelfth of March is when the government instituted the lockdown in Belgium, and the next Monday I had a meeting, and instead of being in this conference room with seven colleagues, we had an online meeting for the first time ever. You know, which is mind-blowing to think about like i remember it felt like the internet had just become a thing you know and we were all sitting there like oh is this is this working do you see me do you hear me and it felt like it was 2000 instead of you know 2020 and it was so weird and and i, I had flashbacks to all these long drives to meetings far you know in ghent and in antwerp and and in brussels and and i thought is this really necessary like why did we do this and now so it's, it's really shown us that it's possible and i think just like what Michiel said that we're gonna to have to find a balance. And it's the same thing that when, like we do for our projects, we do a lot of information sessions at night with a lot of people that show up and we talk to them, we talk to them about alternatives for a car. And a lot of people will say, well, I can't do that because I need to pick up my kids and drop them off there and then do this and then do that. And I'll say, yeah, but it's not really that much about you as it is about the person who works near a train station and lives near a train station, but has a company car and uses it, you know? It's about those people that can actually make that change easily. If we if we get them by themselves, then we'll solve our, our problems. It's not about getting everyone to daily work 100% of the time. It's not about giving everyone on a train 100% of the time. But if we can invest in the people that can actually do it and that you know want to do it and maybe haven't because it's more comfortable or it's they just haven't thought about it or their employer doesn't offer it or whatever. And so I think all of these changes with you know with with the balance, it can work out to to really positive effects, especially in a country like ours that is, you know, completely congested with all due respect for Sweden and its big cities. But what we have in, in Flanders is, is is absolutely insane and it exists almost nowhere else in the entire world where an entire region and not just the cities is just so completely messed up, both urban and mobility wise. And I just <laughs> hope that we can do something about it in the in the near future. Yeah. I think the positivity of the panel is already encouraged in the chat, but Michiel, <laughs> do add a takeaway, uh, please, before the end of the session. 
or will go if you're ready for it. I, I'm ready for it. Last uh, quote. Uh, do you hear? Yes. No. Sorry, we'll go here. Um, Michiel, I will give you the floor. Um, yeah, I'm not sure because when I saw me? Katrina's, yeah, well. Did... Yeah, that's okay. Go ahead. Okay, so what I heard Katrina saying was like quite the same as what we're doing in Antwerp when it comes to, for example, an application that shows you all kinds of mobility solution, which I would think would be great in the future is if you use, for example, Google Maps, which is everybody is using it to check their mobility options that you can now click on it to go to Uber and to see, uh, to take an Uber ride. If it's that easy to take a mobility as a service solution. So you click on it, you just get your roads totally, um, like for example, paid for with uh, public transport, uh, sharing bikes and so on. So I think this, uh, listening to Katrina, I was thinking like we're all doing more or less the same. If this kind of stuff could be like combined in a, a big uh, player, like for example, Google, it would all help us quite a lot. Yeah, and then I think I think there is an interesting add-on there that, of course, it's um, culturally um, um, influenced. I mean, we all have our, our own culture of working, of living, of traveling, and of course, our behavior is, is influenced by that. But on the other hand, there are some main tendencies as well, and, and, and maybe we could influence each other positively in that regard. Um, in that regard, I think this exchange of ideas was extremely uh, important. <laughs> I think we had uh, insights from the, the north, from the middle, and from the south in the chat. Um, and I do think the, we have to do this more to learn, um, at least digitally, this is possible in these times. <laughs> um, my only concern is that we have to get everybody on board. I think uh, the idea of have, having everybody included in mobility, also the digital solutions is, is still also a great challenge uh, that we have to embrace and to get on with um, to make it more sustainable for everybody. Um, um, with that, I don't know if somebody still wants to add something to this session. Um, it's four o'clock, so um, in one minute, Pasquale will <laughs> turn this off. <laughs> um, if not, I would like to thank you um, very hard for this session to all the participants. We didn't see you, but you were there. That was for sure to be there uh, for the questions we had from your site. Everything will be online um, available afterwards. Um, you have all the contacts of the speakers, so do not hesitate to contact them with other questions that come afterwards. And please keep safe and healthy uh, till the lockdown is over. <laughs> and then I really hope that next time we will see each other in a live session um, because I'm sure that will even still be more interesting than today. Thanks a lot. Keep safe okay. and hang on there. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much.